Hey everyone, I'm going to talk about uh, Eurasia design. Before we dive in, let me quickly introduce myself. Uh, I'm a designer primarily. I also develop on the site for Android and the web, but design is like completely my passion. I'm still doing engineering. I'm in second year. Uh, long way to go. Very difficult journey. Uh, aside from college, I'm also uh, co-founding my own company, and I'm consulting for a firm in the US. Um, before we dive in, let me quickly ask, how many of you have heard of creative design? Okay, great. One. Okay. So, has anyone visited the material design website? I hope so. Yes? Any knows? Good. So, front and center of the material design website, Google says, design for the user and everything else will follow. This philosophy portrays that if we keep the user in mind and focus on user-centric design, where every decision we take and every UI element we put in place is designed to make the user experience simpler and more efficient, everything else will fall into place later. Because if the user can use the app well, it means the product is successful. But does that make sense? Because if we say design for the user, that is us effectively classifying the entire world's population into one user and then going on to define for that user. Now, we have diversity sets so varied where we can factor in things like age, gender, race, outlooks, touch accuracy, color blindness, and other things like this. Now, a set so diverse it is not right to combine that into one user and then say design for that user. Because then we are not keeping everyone else's needs in mind. Even if you are conducting testing, A-B testing between two features in your app and you are seeing a really positive outlook where one, one set has like perhaps 75% ratio of working and the other one has a 25% ratio. Even if you say that is a good, good ratio between the two, like one is really much higher and you go on to design for using that principle, you are still ignoring a quarter of your user base, which is a quarter is a significant number. So, classifying the entire world's population that is online into one user and then designing for that according to Google's design for the user philosophy is something that is not really correct of us to do as designers and developers. What should someone ask, what should we do? That's what the whole talk is about. So, this leads to the principle of something called mutative design. Now, before we dive into what mutative design is, uh, let me quickly start with a backstory which will help us understand it better. So, the pioneer of mutative design is a Google expert called Liam Spreadman from New York. And his journey began when he met a woman with MS. Now, MS is a degenerative disease which attacks the nervous system and it doesn't let you really use your smartphone with the best accuracy. And she had a device and she was attempting to place a call, but because of her nervous system problems, her touch accuracy wasn't really so great. She was misclicking constantly and you know, dialing the wrong numbers and had an overall poor experience. Now his solution at the moment was to fix it, was to give her a device with voice actions enabled, so she would quickly tell the device to call someone and to go ahead and do it. The second thing that triggered the idea of interior design in him was he was hired to design an app for children. Now, even though the client was looking to target the entire audience between 2 to 15 years old, that's a really volatile audience is because there are you see some toddlers who can barely touch the screen to mature teenagers who are much more advanced features of it. Now, how can you design one app for that entire set of users? You can say perhaps design for the, the easiest interface possible. Large buttons, colorful UI for the youngest set of users because they are the ones going to have the most difficulty. But if you only design for them and keep those things in mind, providing a dumbed down experience to the users who actually know how these things work. So you're sacrificing their experience at the cost of some and you're not catering their entire user base. This brings us to this brings us to mutative design. Mutative design is a theoretical design methodology for, for user interfaces and user experiences that are born, live, and evolve according to a user's reality. 
simply put it is a design philosophy that aims to tailor an app design that specific user each each user will have the app installed but each user will have the experience differently tailored to their needs their wants and their abilities let's get into the concept of interactive design we mentioned that a bond lives and evolves according to user's reality so what is the user's reality they are not just simply things like what we mentioned age and ability there are also things like ambient lighting data availability let's break them down user behavior could be something like perhaps someone doesn't have the best uh, user typing and they end up pressing the wrong buttons too often it's very common user characteristics could be things users tend to do user experiences would be perhaps users using the app in, sun in sunlight and experience is really visible and theoretical personal information is stuff we can generally know from probably from the google account or from the device itself this is the user's age and gender and preferences so bring this to why mutate so right now as designers and developers we have we have different problems for example let's pick up web designers people who design hybrid apps they have the cross platform part of it nailed down because their design requires a cross platform that is set for them so they focus on working across screen sizes bunch of media queries in it on the other hand app developers their screen sizes handle really well for them with the layout folders so they focus on the cross platform aspect of it but then is that all are we are screen sizes and platforms the only things that we need to adapt to it's not because the user is more important than just the device or the platform we are designing for the user we are forgetting that part and just catering to the device or platform that the user is using accessibility now there are so many problems that happen in accessibility most of us tend to ignore it even if you pick up a few things like say we design for color blind users so now most developers when they approach this they simply do things like a higher contrast perhaps not using red and green side by side but most of us aren't even aware that there are four different types of color blindness not just the ones that, that are mainstream but keeping everything in mind four types of color blindness different types of touch accuracy and a whole bunch of accessibility features that will it will, it will break down the core user experience because you can't keep all of them in mind okay legacy users as is it familiar with technology we know that if we were perhaps to put a uh, three lines in the top corner of the screen it would mean we could swipe from the left and open a hamburger menu what about this guy a kid who is just not even a kid it could be an adult someone who is just exposed to technology and isn't really familiar with the stack that we have been living with since years they don't know how things work they don't know what the three lines signify they don't know what a floating action button does what about them if we could design for them and perhaps don't use a navigation door and switch to tabs but where are apps would work better than navigation door then like i said only way adapting on the experience for the power users who know the pattern user design methodology user design is broken down into three main parts the first of them is characteristics versus extra characteristics characteristics are things that belong to the user and extra characteristics that belong around the user so the ones on the left are characteristics like we talked about vision age and touch accuracy and extra characteristics could be things like data availability lighting conditions sound etc quick look at this so if we were to view this is the same app used in a bright lighting condition and a perfect lighting condition like perhaps the office environment now if this was using a light ui it would not really be visible in sunlight because everything moves all colors move towards white in sunlight so this wouldn't really be a good experience if it used a white this is one of the reasons we need to mutate the important thing while considering mutate design is that we need to differentiate between long term characteristics and short term behaviors with a quick example so last night you have a you are irritated with something or something on your mind and you're texting someone frantically because it's very urgent and you end up typing a whole lot of buttons really quickly 
and attempting to get your message out. And if your material design framework picks that up and says that the user doesn't have the greatest search accuracy, that fact would be wrong because your state of mind at the moment is temporary and not a permanent characteristic of you. So it's really important for while considering material design to differentiate between long-term characteristics and short-term behaviors. Because designing for a short-term behavior would ruin the material experience because it is not 100 best percent translation of what, how the user's characteristics are. The second is something called the mother design. Now, uh, let's look at this. Suppose we were, we mentioned about mutating in bright lighting. Okay? Suppose our solution to mutating for bright lighting is to make the color palette of the app darker. Now, in this, the mother design would probably be blue in the center. So, mother design is the base that we build upon. It is the archetypal foundation, fundamental archetype of the entire app. It is, it establishes a base and we go on to build upon that. So if you look at this example, the user may never even see the blue, which is the mother design, because of the way that it mutates according to the lighting condition. So at the same time, the one on the left, the one on the right, would be the text color against it. So in a bright lighting condition, you would perhaps have a darker background with light text on it. And as the user moves into better lighting conditions, it would mutate towards a lighter background with dark text on it. Mother design is important because it is a starting point for all decisions that are made. It lies in the background and the app does not move away from it. That is something that cannot mutate. Mutations are performed upon it, but not on it itself. Okay. Starter states are direction that you go after the mother design. So if you look at this graph, there are multiple starter states. It could be something like this, where based on the lighting, user's lighting, you darken the button, color of the button. Or it could be something like the one on the right, where based on the user's familiarity with tech, you use a text button instead of a floating action button. So starter states are these mutations on the mother design, which are firmly established, and based on certain criteria, they go ahead and mutate. Now, the starter states are important because they are the first step of mutation. They are the thing you pick up, like for example, light, light, lighting, you mutate from there. Now going deeper, the statistics can combine and provide a clear experience, like perhaps if lighting is bad and the user is not familiar with tech, you would provide a dark square button. The statistics are the first mutations on the mother design. Now, before we proceed further, there will be some doubts coming about mutated design in your mind. So let's quickly address those. The first is user confidence. Now, when a lot of designers and developers hear about mutated design, their first thought is, what will happen to the user experience if I change how the app looks or behaves while they're using it? The second doubt it could come is accounting for everything. Like I mentioned, there are a lot of states that have to be accounted for. And as developers and designers, we cannot account for all the possible states. And third is deciding when to mutate. We mentioned long-term characteristics and short-term behaviors. And knowing which is when, which is what, and when to mutate upon that is another thing that really needs to be kept in mind while doing mutated design. But we'll get to these doubts later because as you dive more into it, you'll understand why these things have to be kept in mind and why they make sense, more sense in mutated design because they are the fundamental base of mutated design itself. So let's have, let's have a look at Gaia. So Gaia is something that aims to solve the accounting for everything problem. So Gaia is a theoretical mutation framework that is based upon a machine learning principle. Our attempts to employ machine learning in design and learn from the user's characteristics and behaviors and you mutate from there. Okay, let's look at this. So Gaia would exist at a framework level. It's theoretical for now, it only exists as a class, but it would theoretically exist at a framework level. So apps would subscribe to this. So let's look at the app at the bottom. The app at the bottom is reporting that the user is touching a little to the right side of the button every time. Such so accuracy is not the great. So Gaia would pick it up the first time. Because the app reports again that again he's touching it off the button. Gaia picks it up a second time. This would happen a few times until the framework is completely sure that yes, this is not something temporary, this is a touch accuracy problem, and it would allow the mutation to go ahead and perhaps increase the button size or move it a little bit in that direction. 
Now, because of Gaia existing as a mutation design framework, when the second app sends the same feedback, the result accuracy is not a great, it would not give the same number of cycles of verification that, yeah, that is a definite problem. Perhaps in one or two passes, Gaia already knows that how the user tries to fix it. So perhaps in one or two passes, Gaia will give it the go ahead, saying that, yeah, we need to mutate on this factor because this is an unknown problem. So Gaia allows a cycle of mutation to happen behind the scenes. It handles the entire uh, getting feedback, employing your fix, getting feedback on the fix, and perhaps course correcting if needed. So for now, Guy is a long way off, but I talked about Neon Sprat in the beginning, and he is developing an app called Selene. So Selene is a note-taking app that is primarily mutated design. It employs the color thing we talked about, moving towards darker colors and bright lighting, and it also uses Gaia as a class. So Selene is completely open source, and it's a really great class to check out. There are links at the end to those sites. So it's a really great class to check out because it shows the users how the framework is receiving the mutated design inputs and making a decision whether or not to mutate. So for now, it exists as a class within the framework, but the community is pushing for it to become something bigger and something better at a more core level to allow it to multiple apps to subscribe to the same framework rather than each app learning multiple times about the user. So we've talked a lot about what it can do and what we should do. But we haven't talked about anything actual material, how it actually would look in a real app. So let's pick up a sample set of how mutated design would change the user experience. The first is mutating for user familiarity. We talked about users who are not really familiar with tech patterns. So in Celine, this is how Celine has two states. So if you open up the app and you have a look at the bottom right corner, the floating action button to create a new node. Now, for uh, users who are familiar with tech, they would know that adding, pressing the button would quickly add a note. But for users who are not really familiar with the pattern of a plus, it gives them a few seconds, and after a few seconds, if no new note has been created, it establishes the fact that, okay, the user isn't really familiar with this, perhaps why they're lingering on the home screen and not creating a new note. So, Serene quickly mutates the floating action button into a text button in the bottom that clearly states and of course, it's in English, but it could be in any language. It clearly states new note. So this allows that user to understand what the floating action button was for, and what it mutated into. And in future passes, if another app had to do this, we could perhaps do it quicker. So one of the things to keep in mind is that if you have a look at Silly, the floating action button, it doesn't disappear and change into a button the next time the app is open. It happens in front of the user. It transforms and becomes a rectangle, and it shows the user where it came from. Because doing it the next time the app is open, result in the we talk about user confusion and user experience. I mean, how do you know that they're going to be confident about using it? So doing it correctly would in, in, involve animating the floating action button into a rectangle, rather than doing it the next time the app is open, which would throw the user off the path. Mutating for visibility. So we talked about sunlight and how an app would look under it. So the ways of designing for lighting conditions is that in white, in bright sunlight conditions, all colors move closer to white. So black becomes dark gray, dark blue becomes light blue. But then if you move closer to white, there's no place for white to move. So white is the immutable color in designing for visibility. So in, if we look at our instinct, and we design according to our instinct that says, the brighter the lighting, the brighter we need the screen to be. So our instinct tells us, okay, make it really bright white and put black text on it, high contrast. But that's not a good solution because white is the immutable color. So you need the text to be immutable, not the background. So if you look at Celine, and if you look at how it shows your notes, it shows them in a variety of colors that you could see on the palette earlier we talked about mother design. But under specific lighting conditions, it mutates towards a darker variant of the mother design brand color. This allows a better contrast. And again, they're not doing it just a sudden change. They're doing it gradually to keep the user's confidence in mind. Okay. 
tutoring for behavior. Now, how many of us have used the floating action button? I think, I think everyone, everyone loves the fab. So, most of us use it thinking that it's a primary action. But do we really know it's a primary action? An app can have multiple use cases. So, let's look at this app. So, the line question aims to draw a grid on the screen. And it, there's a variety of options like changing the color and changing the type of the grid. But a lot of users just enter the app, turn on the grid, and leave. Now, this is something I worked on myself. So, I could observe users' patterns, and most of them were just entering it, pressing the button, and leaving. Because the grid stays persistent. But I could not confidently move to using the floating action button as a permanent action. Because not all my users were doing it. So, iterating for user behavior would involve something like measuring the ratio of how many times that button is the first item clicked, and how many times you click on another item before pressing that. So, if you look at this from a developer's perspective, this would involve a simple checking which thing is pressed first by perhaps a motion down event, and then checking the ratio when it's open. If it's high enough, because the floating action button is 98% use case, if the ratio between the first touch of the switch and so the other item is high enough, could perhaps mutate into a floating action button. So what this would do is the fab is really easy to look at and really easy to click click on, and it's right there in the corner of the screen. It's easy to touch access, and users are familiar with it. It's a very common pattern. So mutating into that would allow them to quickly enter the app and press the button rather than reaching to the top of the screen and toggling the switch every time because the switch involves pressing it at the top corner. Fab is at the bottom and it's much easier to access a larger touch target. Mutating for touch accuracy. Now again, this is something we're going to talk about from a more down to uh, a more developer's perspective because everything up to this point has been highly theoretical. Okay, let's 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 look at a, a typical material design dialog. Now, the buttons are touching each other. Sure, they have a padding around the text, but the buttons usually touch each other. Not only that, but both the dialog buttons are about 24 dp away from the dialog's edge. Now, keeping in mind that dialogs can also be dismissed by touching outside the dialog, and considering how that would work, you really don't have such a great touch accuracy. Like perhaps picture a little older user who can't touch on the point the first time. You need a few tries. Now, it would that wouldn't make a big difference when there's a button on a screen. But they could try again. But imagine an important dialog pop popping up, and they're trying to do one of the actions, but perhaps the positive action because the decision thing is completely closer off the bat. So they're trying to touch the positive action, but they end up 24 dp is a very small space on the screen. It's like perhaps less than a centimeter. So even when they're less than a centimeter off, they end up dismissing the dialog rather than pressing the positive button. So this would, uh, this would, uh, margin of error is there because the error can be accidentally dismissed. So, mutating on this would perhaps move the buttons little, to, little up and little to the left, uh, if that is the case of the dialog is being dismissed, or perhaps the user ends up pressing the wrong button or pressing outside the margins of the button, the button spacing could be increased. Now, this is really efficient because the user don't end up dismissing the dialog. And they don't end up pressing the wrong button. So just moving a little bit during the user usage would improve the user experience because they press, they press the action they want. They don't mistakenly, mistakenly press something. Now again, if you look at implementing this for all users, it would not make sense because it's a waste of space. All of us don't need large buttons and large margins. Only a few of us need it, and we need to solve the problem by detecting for those who need it and doing it only for them. Now let's look at another example for mutating for physical accuracy. So, so this is something we look at from a very, very developer's perspective, okay? Now, this is, everyone has used list views. So, in list view, we specify a row view and then go on for that in the adapter. Now, pick a, a simple app like perhaps a contact app. And imagine a little elderly user using the contact app and mistakenly pressing the wrong contact every time. Now, the typical list height that we keep in material design 
is around 56 dp. But for the elder, for an elder user, that isn't enough. You can't increase it for all because that will show less amount of contacts on the screen and provide a less than optimal user experience. So we mutate on that design. Now, how can we achieve this? So, imagine we have the row view, and within that we have three layouts. You can be any layouts of your choosing. The typical row view is 56 dp, and we break that down into perhaps an 8, 8, and 40 ratio, and set the same touch action for all three. So all three, if the reach two is meant to dye the contact, all three touch targets would do the same action. But the app and the framework would both detect when either the extreme top or the extreme bottom touch target is pressed rather than the center of the button. So ideally, the app would send this to the Gaia framework, which would then record that the, uh, the user is not really touching very accurately, and they're touching the top or bottom targets, which would perhaps lead a mutation. For the first couple of times, this will not be anything because it could be a short-term behavior rather than a long-term experience. But over time, as Guy realizes that this is happening more and more often, it would allow a mutation and let it increase to say certain multi design limits that we have, like 64 dp, 70 dp, and so on. Now, rules of material design is one of the most important things because material design is like a loaded gun. You can do something really bad and end up ruining the complete user experience of the app. This session aims to address most of the doubts that we talked about earlier. So, users conflict. If you, if you pull out the rug from under the user and end up drastically changing the app experience, the user is not going to like the app because if they're familiar with one thing and they're using the app again and again and coming clicking on the same thing every time, changing that suddenly result result in user being really frustrated with your with how you implemented new state design. So, doing it gradually, like we talked about in Celine. Perhaps uh, over time, it could be something, something simple like we should, I wrote, show you the mother design where there was a base brand color and there was the darkest color. Now, we could do it by saying that okay, if this light is above a certain threshold, just use the darkest color in the palette. But that would not make sense because you're going from the lightest to the darkest in one move and you're not really providing a good user experience. So, instead, what Mutate Design would suggest is that you set certain breakpoints in the light intensity. And when it reaches those, it becomes a little bit darker. If you do this, if you do this over time, and you perform mutation, mutations within the user's expectations and not perhaps exceed them and break their confidence, you would not, you would make the user not, I mean, they wouldn't lose their familiarity with the app. So staying within their limits and within their bounds and not pulling the rug out from under them. The important thing is, Starter states that we talked about, which is the initial mutations on the mother design, these have to be firmly established. Like perhaps, let's, let's look at Celine again. So, I showed you the home screen where there's a floating action button which mutates into a rectangular button. Now, it could also be the case that every time the user opens the app, they don't instantly press the button, maybe for a certain set of reasons. Maybe they have distracted at the time or they end up looking at some from other perhaps other tabs or something. So the starter states are firmly established, then the design will roll back. Like perhaps in the next few times they end up pressing floating action button quickly, which means they either learn the use of the fab or they're familiar with pattern from first. The design can roll back and perhaps stop transforming it into a rectangle and just keep it as a fab, not dumbing down the interface for the user. So starter states need to be firmly established. So in case you need to course correct during the user usage, you can quickly roll back to an established data state. So, the second thing is inherent characteristics. So, if we, we talk about a lot of things that we have to keep in mind, about four types of color blindness, multiple types of accessibility, touch accuracy, etc. So, as designers, if we think that this is a certain set of things that we need to mutate for, then we are right back to square one, because we are doing what we think is right, for a certain set, rather than allowing it to go on infinitely. So, in the long run, this would be handled by machine learning, but in the short run, the mutated design community is coming together to establish a wide and 
complete subset of all mutations that could be performed for now. And Gaia in the long run would uh, leave that to machine learning. So the important thing here is to not do what we think is right, but rather to alert to the, what the community is doing and leave it to machine learning in the future. Because we come in right back to square one, we trust our instinct over what is actually happening. Maintaining a user's identity. So if you would do an analogy on this, it could be that if you are mutating a, 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 the human body. And so if maintaining your identity, it would perhaps be increasing the length of the arm. Doing something else would perhaps be removing the arms and growing three legs instead. This would not make sense because you are losing the identity of the human body. So coming back to this, you need to maintain the product's identity. Like you look at the mother design, you could have moved from light blue to black. And that would have the best readability. But if we move to black, we would lose the app's branding and the product blue color, which would completely lose the product's branding. It would not, it would not look like Celine anymore. It would look like it's just a notes app with a black notes blue. So the important thing is to keep the product's identity in mind so that even if I, suppose I use Celine and mine mutates to a darker color, if I hand it off to someone, they know it's just a dark color of the mother design, not something completely different. Uh, you, can, you can look at what I talked about. Moving to black would lose the identity of the blues, but thing within the spectrum of the blue would not have that effect. Deciding when to mutate. So one of the important things you need to keep in mind is monitoring characteristics over time and not mutating for short term behaviors. Another thing to keep in mind is to respect the boundaries of the platform and the product. Or perhaps if we set it up so that Every time the user clicks on the top or bottom of the list view, you increase the height. But if you don't cap that, you perhaps end up with a contact the entire half the size of the screen. So we need to keep the device's boundaries in mind. Another place that could be, this could be looked at is, suppose the user is touching the top right corner of the button. And to fix that, you perhaps move the button a little to the top or a little to the right. Because the user touches there. But if you keep doing that, the button is going to end up moving off the screen. This is again breaking the boundaries of the device. Another way this could be talked about is if we see that most of our users are coming from another platform and we perhaps mutate to based on that platform guideline, we will be breaking the boundaries of the platform itself. So all these three things that the boundaries of the product, the platform, and the device should be kept in mind while performing mutations. This mutation can also be course corrected. We talk about if something goes wrong and the user doesn't want to do it anymore, like if the touch accuracy gets better after some time, we could quickly roll back to the initial 56 dp height of the list view that we have. So course correcting and rolling back for statuses is another important thing in mutated design. Let's have a quick recap of what we talked about. So we talked about user-centric design and how that disregard our, the diversity in our population by overlooking simple things that define a user and make each of us unique. It's, it's an abstraction of a very, a very large set because human beings are very varied and combining them into one user and designing for that user is, doesn't make sense. Yeah, so user design aims to solve this by tailoring the design for that user itself and keeping in mind his outlook, his needs and his behavior rather than for that perfect set that we form. Things to keep in mind while implementing mutated design, within the user expectations, we don't pull the rug out from under the user, because that will be breaking the experience and overwhelming the user, taking away what they're familiar with. Mutate within a set of rules, respect the boundaries of the platform, the device, and the product identity itself, because breaking those would prove disastrous for all three things. So, links. So, William Ferrarian has been taking the entire user design community forward. So, three really easy links to look at. The first is Selenium's complete source code, which you can look at and it shows you the Gaia class. It shows you how it reads the light sensor values and darkens the palette of the brand. It also shows you how it performs the animation between the floating action button, when the animation triggers, and when it changes to a rectangle button. 
The second is, oh sorry, the first one is the link to the app, and second is the link to the source code. And the third is uh, the link to the media design community, where all the discussions are taking place right now, and all the decisions about it are being voted on as a whole. So I'll take a few questions. Hey, uh, thanks. It was interesting. <coughs> so, uh, my question is regarding the when you talk about the from floating button to uh, you know bottom bar, uh, why not to show something like tooltips? So, is it against the philosophy of like mutative design? Like, since that we understand that user is probably not understanding the floating button, uh, then in, in animating it into a bar, we can even show a tooltip that what this. Uh, button can do and then probably the user can understand. Okay. So, so if you're showing the tooltip, <coughs> you're not going towards the user, you're bringing the user to you, which defeats the purpose. You don't have to make the users familiar with your patterns, you have to adapt your patterns for their level of familiarity. I hope that answers the question. So, uh, Regarding the machine learning approach, yes. um, also is like, does A/B testing also falls into this or not? Like, because when you say that uh, you sometimes you set the rules for common users and then we rely on machine learning, but what if also we rely, we rely on A/B testing for even the basic rules and then can that be reliable and then or? So again, A/B testing doesn't really work and it breaks because even if we see a 90% success rate. We're still ignoring a tenth of our users. And mutual design aims to cater to every single user by providing a tailored experience and not doing by, by the popular vote or making everyone decide on one feature. So you design for the specific user and tailor the experience according to them. So uh, my question is regarding the mutative design ecosystem for apps. So say I have uh, multiple apps which follow mutative design. So is it, uh, so what possibility do you think, uh, do you see like they, the apps can intercommunicate? So just one app can uh, decide whether the user is colorblind or he has some nervous problem. So that is the idea behind the Gaia framework. So right now it exists only as a class within the Celine app and only the Celine app can access it. But the community is pushing to include it at a more core level. So right now you, you either need to have inter app communication using that Gaia class. It should not really be the best in terms of security. So Gaia aims to solve that by being a mutative framework at a more deeper level in the, in the system. So that all apps could subscribe to the framework. So this would work because suppose the, user, the framework knows that this user is not familiar with newer patterns like the floating action button. Before he even opens your a new app that's installed, framework tells him that don't use the floating action button. Use a rectangular button instead because this user is not familiar with newer patterns. So right now it's just a class within one app because this is a relatively new movement and it's, we're trying to expand it. But hopefully in future it's at a more core level in the system. Hello. Hi. Yes. So uh, we have an enterprise application and uh, it's used a lot by people who might not be very tech savvy and they have to use it in outdoor conditions. So I am interested in knowing like uh, what are the parameters with which you decide uh, the context of the user. Say for instance the tech size of our app, uh, the font is uh, very large. So when I first saw it, I felt like this can't be true. This cannot be a production app. But then I was told that uh, people who are using it outdoors, they need the size of the font to actually see. Otherwise, they'll find it very difficult to use the app. So um, you mentioned that uh, the machine learning approach. Now, machine learning has to have a set of input parameters. So what are the parameters to decide that this user is not tech savvy or this user has a vision problem? They have so the machine issues. learning approach is really far off. But how we would do this something right now is we could pick up whether the user is outdoors or not by the lighting condition because you don't really have sunlight intentionally lighting indoors. So perhaps if the light sensor of the device itself is picking up a really bright light, it could mean the user is outdoors. So this parameter could be applied to both increase the contrast of the app itself and provide a larger text size. Whereas for the text savvy users, I think we can look at something like we did. We'll have, the user doesn't use a floating action button much, which means perhaps not familiar with this technology. Another way this could be looked at, which was, I think it was a really 
big discussion in the design community sometime back was the use of the navigation drawer. So a lot of people didn't like the navigation drawer because it used to stay hidden off the screen and users weren't familiar with it. So the solution that time was to open it the first few times so you know knows where it is. But if you look over time and you see that the user is still not using it very frequently, it would mean perhaps not familiar with that pattern. So you could move for simpler approach like tabs. Yeah. Okay. Uh, firstly, uh, uh, very interesting topic and uh, the talk was very good. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, my, uh, like this morning when I was coming, uh, uh, I had maps on and every time we would pass an underpass, the interface would change to a, a more contrasting colors. So I think that's an example of media yes. uh, design. So if you look at maps, even at night, it becomes, it becomes darker. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah, I mean, it was very impressive that uh, as I approached an underpass, the colors change, and as, as soon as I came out the of the underpass, it changed back to its original colors. So, uh, any other examples that stand out like this, like that, that you might be able to highlight? Like so I think Serene is like the go-to for military design right now. Yeah, I mean that seems like more like an example app right now, uh, which is uh, very focused on. So li in live design. apps, I talked about the feline pushing app. Sorry. I talked about the grid app. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that is something that's in production and okay. it's actually using motor design in production. Okay. Uh, like uh, any other apps, like from the from the more popular ones that you see, uh, have any of those that have good examples of? So uh, I would actually get back. Well, so this is really new movement. New movement. Okay. So yeah. which, which is barely more, le less than a year old. Right. Yeah. So we're trying to get it out to using more popular apps. Okay. Most people are they know about it, they're thinking about it, mm -hmm. but they're not sure whether they want to put it in production yet. Perhaps the movement grows bigger, hopefully we'll see it come into more popular apps. But right now I think it's limited to a few apps, it's more theoretical than practical. Also do you, uh, do you see it uh, as being something of more of a concept or uh, in, in developing countries or in countries where people are now getting more tech savvy than they were earlier? So would you think that's a thing like, uh, like maybe in uh, developing markets like uh, India, like n now people with WhatsApp and all are like, there's an entire demographic which earlier wasn't much into this app usage and are now getting onto it. So do you think this is one of the things that applies more to them? I think it definitely applies more to them because even if we see that, okay, India is developing more and we start using the newer patterns, there's still a large population in India that is not familiar with the pattern. So I think this is definitely one case that it needs to apply in developing markets where you design for users who are tech savvy as well as those who are not. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Karthik, can you see the links? So it's source.pb.xyz. The simple links is selene.pb.xyz, source.pb.xyz, and community.pb.xyz. Any more questions? I think we're done then. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.